right. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming to the October uh, edition of Conversations with Caregivers. Um, we do this monthly. The Dementia Care Collaborative offers this program the third Tuesday of every month, so feel free to put that in your calendar now. Just mark off the third Tuesday of every month. 5.30 to 7. We're working on planning our 2021 season right now. Um, so I'm just going to go over some really super basic logistics and then um, we'll get into our program. Oh, Chris has got his eye on the foyer. Thank you. Um, so many of you have probably been on Zoom a lot and maybe some of you it's new. Um, so just know that you can toggle back and forth between a gallery view and a speaker view. Gallery view, like you want to see and check out who else is in the space with you. Speaker view will of course focus on the speaker and I will be using a spotlight feature when different speakers are going so that they are spotlighted. So you'd like why am I not being able to control this? I'm spotlighting people or one of my colleagues. So as you know, you all came in on mute. Um, if you can do your best not to unmute yourself, that would be great. Um, this is being recorded. You might see the little red button that says recording. So your face or your name will not be recorded when we, we host this on our website. So it's just gonna be the speakers and their slides. So you don't need to worry about any privacy issues. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. The chat feature is um, at the bottom to the left of share screen. Um, so you can put a, a question in the chat box at any time. And Barbara Moskowitz is moderating and she'll keep her eye on the chat box. And when we get to the end, um, there will be Q&A. Um, I think those are really all of the Zoom logistics. Um, we are gonna have two speakers and then Q&A. We're gonna aim to wrap up actually a little bit before seven. So we're gonna do our best for that. Um, and I'm going to send some resources out after the program. And I think that's it. I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara Moskowitz who is the Assistant Director of our Caregiver Support Program. Um, and Thank she you. will take it away. Hi everyone, it's a real pleasure to be with you tonight. And uh, first, I'd like my colleagues to wave. Uh, you've met Nori Mazone, our coordinator, project coordinator, program coordinator, Chris White, our wonderful social worker, Judy Willette, our senior manager, uh, Susan Rowlett, our director, is on a well deserved vacation. So, welcome everyone. And I saw Gabrielle Rex somewhere in the audience. She is our wonderful colleague as well. So welcome. And uh, as many of you, our friends, already know, uh, the Caregiver Support Program of the Dementia Care Collaborative was started at Mass General in 2017. And we're a part of the Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine Division. As many of you also know, the mission of our program is to transform memory care. And we exist at Mass General to educate, connect, and support patients, caregivers, and clinicians. We do that by offering consultations, care consultations, to caregivers and patients in specific Mass General clinics, skills classes for caregivers, support groups, and health and resiliency programming. The Caregiver Support Program is entirely funded through philanthropy. And if you're interested in learning uh, how to support our program, please contact any one of us on the team. And now it's my fantastic pleasure and honor to introduce our two speakers this evening. I'll tell you a little bit about each and then the program will begin. Our first speaker tonight is Dr. Christine Ritchie who holds the Kenneth Meinecker Endowed Chair in Geriatrics at Mass General. She is both a geriatric and palliative care physician and is a director of research in the Division of Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine at Mass General. She currently conducts research which is focused on optimizing the quality of life of people who have serious chronic disease and multi-comorbidity. 
And Dr. Ritchie is also the director of the Mangan Institute Center for Aging and Serious Illness at Mass General. Dr. O'Karaki, uh, Dr. Olivia O'Karaki, is a board certified geriatric psychiatrist and associate professor of psychiatry, as well as associate professor of epidemiology at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She is Director of Geriatric Psychiatry at Mass General and Research Director of the Geriatric Psychiatry Clinical and Research Program at Mass General Hospital. I will tell you that their biographies are much longer and they have given me permission to amend them so that you can enjoy them and learn from them. So I'll turn it over now to our first speaker, Dr. Christine Ritchie. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. And uh, it is such an honor to be here with you this evening and to be able to share this time with you. So about uh, October of last year, I think this picture would have had very little meaning for most of us. And now our world has changed dramatically because of SARS coronavirus too. I think early on, we thought that this was gonna be hard. Uh, it would be a race maybe a mile or two, but we could get through it. And instead, it's been more like this. The end is not clearly in sight, and what we thought was a blip in the radar is now turning into a totally different radio frequency. And there are a lot of challenges with what we have to do to stay healthy right now with respect to the pandemic. We know masking and physical distancing are key to our health right now, but they can wear us down. They make us feel isolated. They can make us feel depressed, anxious. We might engage in chemical coping. And some of us might even feel like we're just not thinking as well as we used to. And then if we are a care partner or a caregiver, we have additional challenges in both caring for ourselves and caring for them. So the question is, how can we stay healthy, connected, and sane as a care partner when life makes that a lot harder? And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to share with you a mnemonic that hopefully will help you think about staying sane during this difficult time. And this is the mnemonic, master stress. And we're gonna go through each one of these letters and hopefully there'll be something that you can think about, not just tonight, but other times when you're feeling stressed. So the first thing is to maintain healthy eating. Healthy eating is worth pursuing regardless of the pandemic. And currently there is no indication that COVID can be caught from food. So with constraints on so many parts of our lives, many of us still, can still make some choices about what we eat and some of you may have heard of the MIND diet, which stands for the Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay, which is quite a long mouthful, MIND is easier. But essentially what it does is it focuses on encouraging us to eat plants, leafy green vegetables, berries, nuts, and avoid uh, too much uh, meat or cheese because it's been shown with this diet uh, that it's very promising in optimizing our brain health. The second is to avoid isolation. It's very easy to feel alone, isolated, and socially dis disconnected right now. And we know that isolation is associated with worse health outcomes. So in this pandemic, we have to work really hard and be pretty creative to stay connected. So what might be some tips for staying connected? First, think about who your vital connections are. Who are those people in your life that are really important for you to stay connected with? And they might not have been people that you've been connected with recently, but this gives you an opportunity to reflect on that. Get their contact information, figure out how to connect with them. Some people might like to connect on Facebook. Some people might like to connect on WhatsApp. Some people might like to connect on FaceTime, but figure out how you can connect to these folks 
who are important to you. And then get creative and try new ways to connect with others. And Nori is going to send you some links for some different ways that you can get creative and try new ways to connect with others. Maybe you've never knit, or maybe you'd like to teach other people to knit, and you could try knitting uh, and teaching knitting to others from a socially distanced perspective uh, as a way of staying connected. Start new hobbies. Maybe you've been thinking for a long time about woodworking or some other thing. Think about what that might look like and use this time as an opportunity to do that. If you need to, get help. And we're gonna talk more about that in just a little bit. It's easy to be consumed by the news right now. There's so much going on, but it is worth reflecting on how the news is affecting you and the person you are caring for. If it is contributing to your stress, it may be worth cutting down, only having the TV on for certain parts of the day and putting your smartphone away, maybe one hour before bedtime or some other kind of strategy like that. If you feel cranky and irritable, you probably need a break. You also may need to get some rest as we are in less control when we're tired. Often we will turn to alcohol or our favorite junk food to reward ourselves when we're feeling this way, but it's more beneficial to, take, to use a journal or talk with a friend or professional to let off steam. Get help. Sometimes this is very hard for us to do. We want to just sort of go on our own. So we somehow feel like it's a sign of weakness to get help from others. It's actually a courageous act. If you need help, to try to get help from others so that you can continue to do and be all the best that you can be. Take a break, read or play, even if it's a game of solitaire or a game of Scrabble on your phone with some other person. Exercise. Do participate in Ageless Grace, uh, a wonderful exercise pro I mean, a program, movement program that we have here as part of our Dementia Care Collaborative. Moving your body is a proven way to relieve symptoms of depression. Get outside. There are lots of reasons to get outside. It's useful to get some just good fresh air, but it's also potentially a way to let off steam. Maybe you've just been really struggling with your caregiving role. Think about getting outside, even just walking around the block to give yourself a time out and think about how you might identify other people to talk to outside uh, as a way of connecting. Pay attention to your anxiety, your frustration, and your fears. It's our body's early warning system that something is not right. So when you feel anxious, stop, breathe, take long, slow, deep breaths in and out. Keep breathing, pray, meditate, Make some tea, anything that will give you a break from what is happening in the moment. Also practice self-compassion. You cannot be perfect 24 seven, and it's impossible to, be, impossible to be in perfect control of how you feel all the time. All of us carry around a lot of shoulds, and those shoulds can sometimes really get in our way of being able to, to enjoy life and enjoy the, the time that we have. So sometimes it may be useful to say, I regret that I'm human and get impatient sometimes. I'm doing the best I can, even though things go wrong from time to time. I regret that I am not perfect. Wash your hands. So consider placing signs in the bathroom or elsewhere if you have someone in your life who sometimes forgets washing their hands. You can demonstrate what it's like through hand washing yourself have alcohol-based sanitizer around, and that can be a quick alternative to hand washing for those in your life for whom hand washing may be more difficult. Finding gratitude has been linked to many benefits, including increased happiness, lower stress levels, boosted immune system, better outlook on life, and improved relationships with those around us. So think about how you might incorporate gratitude into your daily routine. Maybe it's a journal. Maybe it's thinking about people that you're grateful for and reaching out to them and thanking them. There are lots of different ways to engage in gratitude. And I think right now in particular, it can be particularly valuable. 
Now, routines can be particularly important, and especially if you have someone in your life who may be having um, struggles with memory or memory impairment or thinking impairment, a planned day allows you to spend less time trying to figure out what to do and more time on activities that provide meaning and enjoyment. Before making a plan, think about what you like and what your care partner's likes or dislikes, what is useful to structure the day and make the day more pleasant. Make sure there's ample time for meals and bathing and dressing, and ideally think about how you might incorporate walking into your day. Sleep has to be put on the priority list, and this is hard for many of us, but lack of sleep leads to all kinds of challenging outcomes. We talked about the crankiness part earlier, but it can also lead to obesity, illness, impatience, inefficiency in accomplishing tasks, and sometimes just a mental state of fogginess that can be hard for us. If you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, it's not related to direct caregiving, talk to your healthcare provider. They may be able to help you think through ways to, to, to get a better night's sleep. And then finally, don't forget to wear that face covering. It's important for us to keep at it, even when we're getting fatigued to do that. So to sum up, when you're having a rough day or you're feeling particularly challenged, think about that mnemonic, master stress. Think about what actually works for you. Maybe it's avoiding social isolation. Maybe it's sleep. Maybe it's thinking about engaging with others. But think about how that might help you and know that we want to support you also in your journey of doing the best you can during this very difficult time. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think um, after Christine's great presentation, should I get started? Yep. Thumbs up? Okay, very good. So I'll move into screen sharing. Okay. So for my section of this, uh, this uh, discussion, this forum that we're having today, I'm going to um, focus in more detail on some of the mental health dimension of uh, dealing with the impacts of COVID-19, particularly at this time. And I always include disclosures. Okay, so as we all know, um, when we think about the impact of COVID-19 among older adults, it's been consistently the case since this all began that the most vulnerable age group are older persons when it pertains to morbidity and mortality. But there needs to be just as much attention on some of the special risks for adverse mental health outcomes. And this can play out in a number of ways. So first of all, there are many people, as I will show momentarily, who are coping with pre-existing mental illness. So that is, they have a history of, of, of mental health or substance use issues that predated um, the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and among those people are even a small percentage of folks dealing with chronic serious mental illnesses, or SMI, um, who are particularly vulnerable. And then um, highly relevant to our interests um, for today are um, people coping with mild cognitive impairment or more serious um, impairments of Alzheimer's disease or related dementias. So how does this manifest in terms of the vulnerability? So there are a lot of people who are affected. Overall, when you think about mood, mood disorders, such as depression, anxiety, alcohol, and substance use disorders, um, there's about a 25% lifetime prevalence overall among all persons age 16 and above. So that means among all persons over 60, they've been affected by one or more of these things at some point in their life. Um, and that's, a, that's, a, that's likely to be a conservative estimate. And 10% at any given time um, are experiencing current prevalence of depression. So that means people are kind of going into this pandemic with a mental health burden um, that could then be exacerbated um, by the stresses of social distancing and um, the isolation that results from social distancing practices and all of the related concerns um, in terms of uh, physical health and um, anxiety about physical health. So we have to think about ways to mitigate the risk of 
the exacerbation of mental illness among people who were already experiencing issues prior to COVID-19. So um, staying connected to regular health care is critical. One of the earliest things that we, we noticed um, when the COVID pandemic began is that there was a sharp drop off in people receiving their regular medical care. So that's everything from screenings, could be cancer screenings, it could be follow up for major medical illnesses, um, but also mental health care. Um, so prioritizing mental health care, not letting it fall off the radar is critical. Fortunately, virtual services have allowed us to um, make health care available to a lot of folks when we can't get into the appointments, but we still have a ways to go um, in terms of improving the access to people in terms of video um, remote care. Um, we're finding, for example, that in many practices, only about 50% of people um, in the age group of 65 plus can regularly participate in their appointments using the video and audio hookup. A lot of people are depending on telephone or other things. And so there seem to be some creative ways um, to increase and ramp that up, um, but that's definitely needed. And it's also um, likely to be the case, and certainly in our outpatient clinic, we're experiencing a bit of this, that people may need more frequent appointments. You know, maybe when they were uh, it was business as usual and they were coming in for face-to-face -face appointments, a person might have come in um, every few months, maybe every six months. But during this time, it may be more necessary to increase the frequency of those brief video appointments instead to stay on top of things. Um, as it pertains to psychotherapy, um, maybe people in the past who had been relatively stable dealing with um, issues of depression or anxiety, this is a time when they could be monitored um, for maybe getting booster sessions to kind of help with coping um, with uh, the stresses and challenges. And that's often very helpful for people coping with anxiety disorders. And when it comes to SMI or the serious mental, uh, mental illnesses, um, there are a number of ways in which COVID can really um, disproportionately affect this group. So under, the, under baseline circumstances, there's already excessive morbidity, mortality, early mortality for people dealing with serious mental illnesses, which is such as bipolar disorder or um, schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. And people age into these disorders, but there is a real um, a detrimental impact on mortality. And there's a high degree of medical comorbidity, such as diabetes, hypertension, pre-existing heart disease, chronic obstructive lung disease. And so what that means is this is a group of folks who are even more vulnerable to the worst complications of COVID. And what's what started to happen, which is fortunate, is that many people who are dealing with SMI are already connected to services in the community that allow a platform for people to have more monitoring and help. And I know that that's benefits some of my own patients who are in their 70s and 80s coping with SMI and needing more enhanced resources. But there's a lot of response that can be provided um, beyond providers and advocates. Um, there's a role for family and friends for all of us, um, whether we're sort of the identified caregiver or we are part of the network. Um, there are proactive steps um, that are needed. Um, outreach calls, more frequent check-ins. Um, as I mentioned earlier, scheduling more frequent appointments and getting them on the books. Um, for check-ins is, is very helpful um, so that we can proactively address issues and shore up needs. Um, certainly within our own clinic, we've sort of started a, a new procedure during this pandemic to try to identify what some of these needs can be and, and, and proactively address some of that. Susan Rowlett um, and others have been involved um, with this, as Barbara knows. And um, to, address, uh, to actively address tech support needs, um, I think that's going to be a really important factor. We're finding that a lot of folks um, will benefit from there just being more resources employed. So, um, you know, everything from, you know, um, sort of concurrent tech support where somebody can call in real time and help with the Zoom connection while a person's trying to get on Zoom or, or anything of that nature, um, uh, helping people um, by sending them the kinds of peripherals they need um, to access video and audio. I think we need to be very proactive about helping folks um, in that regard. And part of why that matters so much is that as people are getting older, there's increased likelihood of dealing with cognitive changes of aging. 
So there's kind of this process of, you know, most people going from normal aging, which is maybe some occasional mild forgetfulness of a name or um, uh, uh, the name of a, a word or something like that, um, to progressively more noticeable impairments. Um, and it turns out that once people are age 60 and above, there's fully about a third, maybe even as close to 40% of the population that experience some kind of significant age-associated memory change. So it could be a self-reported memory change or cognitive change, or it could be something that a doctor has diagnosed, but it's quite common. And that means that um, there's more and more people um, in our population as the years go on who are dealing with um, these kinds of significant impairments and an increasing proportion of people who are dealing with some of the most serious impairments such as Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And this, um, this metric shows there's about 6 million people as of 2020, but that number will continue to grow over time. And so individuals, older individuals with cognitive impairment are dealing with the challenges of COVID-19 under conditions of decreased resources. So there's more task demands. There's more new things that have to be figured out, things that have to be organized. There's more executive demand on people. And yet this is a time of life when many people may be dealing with decreased cognitive resources. Dealing with even some of the adaptations related to social distancing can be a challenge or dealing with some of the adaptations related to being careful um, and avoiding infection can be challenging. Um, Dr. Ritchie, for example, mentioned um, the challenges of staying on top of hand washing and some of these things that we need to be thinking about and attending to regularly that are difficult under normal circumstances, but particularly challenging if coping with cognitive impairments. So um, the other thing that also can be relevant here is that there's been a dramatic change to people's daily routines and environments where it used to be possible for people to shift between in-home environments and maybe taking a walk outside or doing various activities in groups, outdoors and indoors, participating in certain routines throughout the day or throughout the week, that's been disrupted. And one of the things that we know is a major trigger for exacerbation of some of the emotional or, or a behavioral symptoms related to dementias is a change in routine and environment. So that is something that happened fairly early on um, that we started to notice and um, it becomes a challenge to sort of restabilize what a consistent new routine and environment can be so that people are, are net less disrupted by ongoing changes in the environment. So what can we do? Um, we certainly enlist um, our networks of you know, care partners as well as other family members and advocates in the community to do outreach, to do check-ins. Um, assistance with technology. Um, uh, it was a really lovely story from uh, one of the, the folks that's in, um, in our, our practice um, where um, there were some community support um, connecting students who obviously have been very affected by the pandemic as well with being that sort of real-time tech support for an older person who needed to connect um, to, uh, to video services. So that's the kind of example um, that I think we, we really need to increase. Um, and certainly helping with arranging regular food and medicine delivery, that's something we figured out very early on, would help people with their, their mental wellness, is being relieved from the anxiety of having to schedule and organize that. So the key goal is really to, to reduce and decompress the task load um, and providing those auxiliary supports for people coping with cognitive impairment can kind of mitigate the risk of um, mental health exacerbation or stress exacerbation related to COVID-19. But we also have to think about the care partners, as, we, as we've heard before. Many care partners are themselves older adults who are at highest risk for some of the more serious complications of COVID. Um, and so their health and monitoring regular checkups, um, as Dr. Ritchie was saying, staying on top of taking care of yourself is critical for, for older caregivers. But there's another aspect to this that's particularly challenging, which is that the social distancing practices that 
are, we know are, are advocated for good medical reasons may often not be realistic or possible, especially in multi-generation households. There are a lot of people who have multi-generation households where there's not even um, the ability to do physical separation where you can have maybe people on one floor and younger individuals on a different floor to sort of mitigate the risk um, of exposure. Um, and that's very anxiety provoking because you, people both want to be together with their families, but at the same time, it's um, stressful for both carers and older patients if they're coping with um, an inability to manage in a practical way social distancing within the household. There's also the stress for caregivers of watching the impact of social distancing on loved ones. And, and many of you may have seen a very compelling um, article that was in the Boston Globe not long ago about the impact of uh, individuals who are in nursing facilities and the stress for family members of watching their loved ones not being able to connect with them directly and not really quite understanding why those separations are happening and the challenges of that. So that's an important thing to be mindful of in terms of impact on caregivers and can contribute potentially to the risk of feeling burnt out, overwhelmed, feeling overtasked. So these are all these considerations um, for, for our caregivers as well. We need to certainly enhance caregiver support and reinforce a sense of feeling valued. And I think that's something that's done so well um, by the Dementia Care Collaborate, Collaborative in terms of not just providing the resources and support, but doing it in a way that reinforces the importance and the value of what the person is trying to accomplish, what they're, what they're doing, and providing advocacy around these challenges. Um, and it can often be something as simple as um, just case by case, just trying to work through what are some of the workarounds in terms of, for example, a caregiver wanting to see someone um, at, at a safe distance who's in a nursing facility, how they can be supported around getting some of that done. Um, and resilience enhancement of resources are always critical. The education and information about wellness strategies, whether it's meditation, mindfulness, remaining physically active with programs like Ageless Grace or, um, you know, chair exercise, chair yoga, you know, anything that people can do, even if it's indoors um, and not um, involving going outdoors to get uh, physical exercise and activity. These are all things that can kind of help bolster our care partners. But I'd also like to turn attention to some other, some of the unique aspects of COVID-19 in terms of how it's affecting older adults that have kind of emerged um, over time, over the last few months in particular. So one of the things that we have definitely detected about COVID-19 is its disproportionate impact in terms of morbidity and mortality in minority groups, Black, Latinx, and Native American groups in particular have been disproportionately affected. And some of this may involve those intersections of race, ethnicity, economics, employment status, and those things that might increase the likelihood of being in a multi-generational household where the exposure risks are different. And that adds a layer of stress, right? Because it's often difficult for people to change their living situation. And yet we know that the number one way in which COVID is transmitted, it's in households. It's not on trains. It's not on buses. It's not on airplanes that everyone's always afraid of. It's mostly happening in households. So the, this, this um, exposure um, and some of the mechanisms for it have disproportionately affected some um, members of our population. And in particular, where there's a background of sort of acute on chronic stress. So there may be structural racism, structural issues in society that are chronic sources of stress. You layer on the acute stress of coping with COVID and all the related challenges. And this increases people's risk of having um, mental health exacerbations or ex experiencing more anxiety or distress. Um, and there definitely have been in minority and at-risk communities reports of increased anxiety level. But in spite of that, at least to the extent that this has been measured um, in some surveys, we're finding that um, those same communities are um, having some success at maintaining optimism, at least their optimism about their ability to continue to persevere through the situation. But beyond the individual, there are a lot of consequences we have to think about in our communities. 
So the fact that COVID at this point now has cost over 200,000 lives, millions of people affected in the United States, means that there are large numbers of people and communities affected by grief and loss. Every person who is lost represents a whole penumbra of individuals in their life, their workplace, their, their communities, their families who are affected by that loss. And that just begins to grow and spread as there are larger and larger numbers of people who succumb uh, to the fatal complications of COVID. Uh, there's also for the community, the risk of a kind of collective fatigue or boredom or malaise. People don't really know, well, when does this all stop? And how do we cope with this uncertainty? Um, some of this may very well, although we're not sure yet, may be contributing to some of the resurgence of infections that have been seen in, in, in certain areas where the fatigue with COVID and social distancing is leading people to maybe um, bring down their guard or act in ways that maybe aren't protecting them optimally. So that's something we have to also be mindful of in terms of the, the mental dimension of how communities are affected. There's also the, the potential for kind of contagions of fears and anxieties. So we, we have to be mindful, as, as Christine was saying, of not letting ourselves get overexposed um, to the news and, and to scary uh, news items about COVID because it's not helpful. Um, to spread that kind of fear and anxiety around COVID, but rather instead to focus on the day-to-day -day things that we can do in terms of keeping ourselves safe and maintaining routines and so forth. And there's also, of course, in the long term, there's a kind of risk of demoralization um, and pessimism, feelings of despair, um, when we don't really address adequately the needs of the community. And I think that's sort of the, the cost of, of inadequately addressing the mental health dimension in the community and not just in the individual. So uh, we have to recognize um, these feelings of abandonment that people can have around um, the response not being adequate to COVID, not feeling protected um, by their government or not feeling protected by their community um, when it comes to the mental health effects of COVID and the physical effects. And taking stock uh, of the spiritual cost of this um, is extremely important, such as, for example, the example uh, I gave of um, the way this has affected people um, who are caring for individuals now living in nursing homes. Community consequences also involve some disruption of social ties and rituals. So we're coming into a holiday season. There've been some major holidays already and we're gonna to continue to have holidays throughout um, the, uh, the year. And this would normally be a circumstance in which older people and younger people across the generations could get together and sort of renew and, and restore um, good feelings through those, um, those social connections. And a lot of those rituals, of course, are going to be disrupted by COVID-19. And there's also lost contributions in the community. So for example, older adults are often some of them, well, not often, they are the biggest contributors um, to supporting uh, voting and election work. So 60% of all poll, poll workers are people over the age of 60 years old. And many charities um, uh, and have found that it's difficult to staff the volunteers that they need to do charity work because many older adults who have to be more cautious about social distancing can't participate in those things as often. So there's a little bit of that loss of the reward of being able to do that. And so how do we foster this um, community resilience? Well, certainly advocating for and facilitating to the best of our ability, uh, virtual and safe distance interactions, whether in care facilities or virtual faith services is important. Sharing information and resources with each other about how to make these things happen is critical. Leveraging opportunities to connect across age groups, like those really cool initiatives that people have taken of getting young people who are already dealing with their own isolation issues from being out of school and off campus, getting those folks to maybe be the tech support for older adults trying to connect to technologies. And I think looking for some of the positive psychology effects 
um, of, uh, of COVID is also important. It's interesting, there are a lot of people who have found that their optimism or sense of resilience has actually increased in the face of COVID-19. And I think we need to learn more about how that's working for people, how that's happening for people so that we can figure out ways to share that with everyone um, and, and help them feel the positive psychological benefit of maintaining some sense of empowerment, maintaining some sense of balance in the face of the stress. So I think that's something else to, to think about. So finally, I'll just end with this last slide that when it comes to thinking about um, how to address the risks of mental health issues and stress related to COVID, I like to use a prevention framework that comes from the National Academies of Medicine. And what it does is it focuses on um, areas of a target. So it could be folks who have early symptoms of stress and symptoms of exacerbation of maybe depression or anxiety. Um, the intervention would involve getting in early to prevent a crisis, to prevent things um, escalating to a crisis, addressing treatment changes, increases in appointments, and so forth. For people who are particularly high risk, maybe because of cognitive impairment, underlying mental illness, increasing that outreach, enlisting support, for patients and their care partners and shoring up essential needs, that sort of decompression of the task load. And then in terms of universal approaches, I think that's where we have to think about both at the individual and in the community level, how we can enhance resilience and sense of wellness. So for example, whether it's increasing those opportunities for intergenerational connections in a socially distanced and safe, safe way, or enhancing those opportunities for people to feel uh, valued and, and, and have a social reward of, of those connections and learning tools such as meditation, mindfulness, and self-care. Uh, so I think I'll stop there and we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so very much. Um, I, we have, um, ah, I, I'd like to start by asking both of you, Dr. Ritchie and Dr. O'Karaki, about how to ask for help uh, on two levels. It's a question, please, for both of you, because you both speak to it so importantly. Um, you've taught us today that, of course, COVID has happened to all of us in the context of who we are. For those of us who might be predisposed to depression or have a history, or even now just feel really in need of more than what my neighbor can do for me. How do I pick up the phone and ask for help, quite literally? And on the, additionally, and I'll ask both, you know, uh, um, I hear all the time from care partners. Oh my, everyone says, call me if you need me. If you want help, let me know. And they say, um, I can't do it that way. So if, if someone has difficulty like asking for help by nature, be it grocery shopping, come take my wife for a walk or whatever, any tips about how to ask for help and even how I as a neighbor can offer help. So it's help in two categories. And then we'll go to the chat questions. Dr. Kiriki, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I'm happy either way. Sure, I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm happy to start. Um, I, I guess I'll respond to some, some pieces of this because there's so many great thoughts in here. So um, when it comes to say something practical like asking for help to get needs met in the home, groceries, medications, and those kinds of things, it is challenging. It's, it's hard, as you, as you say, for some folks to kind of admit they need a little bit of that auxiliary support. So in the position of someone who's a friend or family member who wants to be helpful, I'd imagine, you know, one sort of creative way of sort of, uh, of dealing with that, especially if it's someone where maybe you sense that there's a little bit of pride involved, is it can just kind of be like a shared activity, like a calling up and, hey, I heard about this really neat thing. I love it. Um, and I'm using this to get my stuff. Can I share it with you? Can I send it to you? Let's try it out together. And that's the kind of thing that might neutralize a little bit um, people's feeling a little sensitive about um, needing, admitting that they need more help um, than they used to. Um, 
And um, so kind of like sharing it as a cool idea and a nice thing to do. And I'm trying it. And how about you try it? And we compare notes about how it goes. Um, maybe that's a way to kind of get over some of that. But you're right. It can really be hard sometimes for people to ask for help. The other uh, approach, and then I'll, I, I think Christine probably wants to weigh in, is sometimes um, just kind of mirroring or, or modeling the activity of asking for help you know, talking about how um, you're dealing with some kind of a challenge and you asked for help and here's what happened and it was so great. Um, and it kind of normalizes um, that process for people. But. Thank you. Dr. Ritchie? Sure, so uh, those are really awesome, uh, Dr. Kerke, thank you. There, there are, for people for whom this is not natural, it's worth thinking about it almost like uh, stretching new muscles or building new muscles as a way of sort of finding out a new kind of strength. And it's hard to think of asking for help as a strength, but it actually is. And here's the one thing that's unusual but true is that most of us deeply benefit from giving help. So it, you're giving somebody else a gift by asking for help because we benefit from that, from that connection. We benefit from both the giving and the receiving. And if you can maybe frame it that way, maybe that'll make it just a little bit easier for you to think about it. But it can be a stretch and it's, some, it, it's often kind of hard work and takes courage at the beginning if you're not predisposed to asking for help. Then I think to the person who says, uh, call me anytime, or if you need help, let me know. It may be worth thinking about, and Dr. Kierke, I think was sort of getting at this as well, having a kind of a menu of things that you might need help for that you could then give them as concrete options. Um, because otherwise it may be that they just don't know what your needs are. And so if you can, if you could say, well, actually, so here's three things, and I know you don't have time for all of them, but gosh, it would be really great, you know, if you could take, um, you know, my car to, to get the oil change or whatever it is. So asking for uh, help uh, that way where you have a menu can be useful as well. Great advice. And now I'm going to read questions from chat. How would you recommend we connect in our loved ones, connect with in our loved ones living in nursing homes or assisted living facilities with whom we can only visit once a week for 30 minutes? Or how do we detect in them issues with, of depression if I could only see my relative for 30 minutes a week? Yeah, this, is, this has been a really big challenge. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that um, the facilities themselves will have certain rules and restrictions um, that can make it challenging to do things the way you otherwise might want to do it. Um, but let's say this is a situation where um, it's possible um, to, to have, let's say, um, you know, a, a brief visit, say in an outdoor courtyard, or something where um, one person's indoors and there's like a window and another person's at a distance um, uh, visiting, if it's that type of a, of, of a scenario, I think that um, um, it can be challenging to pick up on is some depression settling in. Um, and certainly one of the signs um, that something like that could be going on is um, certainly, if, if your loved one says anything that sounds more despairing or um, indicates um, a, a low mood or um, a, a feeling of sadness, but a lot of times it may be that, um, you know, if you inquire also with, um, with staff there, if you're finding out of a loss of appetite, um, loss of weight, um, activity changes that are uncharacteristic, um, looking for those kinds of signs may be particularly important in picking up on depression because a lot of people in that situation, we call it depression without sadness, they won't endorse feeling sad. Um, so it'll come out more as just losing interest in things, being bored, seeming less engaged, not doing the things that they used to do. Um, and so that might be possible to pick up on in those brief interactions and then follow up with questions um, to, um, with nursing staff. And also, don't hesitate to engage 
your doctors or the doctors of your loved ones. Um, because I'll tell you, I speak with staff members at nursing homes of my patients, and it makes a difference in terms of people knowing that somebody's really paying attention and interested in knowing, do we need to increase this antidepressant? Do we need to be concerned about whether depression is worsening? Um, don't feel like you have to do this on your own. That's our big message, right? Um, you, you know, utilize the supports you have, and that can include other family members, it can include friends, but it can also include health providers as well, where that's possible. Really helpful. Um, Dr. Richie, I have a question for you. This is follow-up to nursing home. Um, I know that you're involved in a lot of state policy and, and, and broad thinking. I'll read this comment. My mother with dementia is in a nursing home. In the spring, every resident got COVID. In the last few months, there have been zero cases. They tracked the cases back to staff, not family. My mother had to change rooms four times since this started. She doesn't know what's happening. She hasn't seen her son from Virginia in a year. The state regulations don't seem helpful. Small question, do you have any input into the state regulations? Really, do you talk to the governor every day? I don't talk to the governor every day, but I, I would say that this has been something we've been very concerned about and we have been thinking about as a community of people who care deeply about the well-being of older adults in our community and especially those who are in long-term care facilities, how to advocate for two things, which is both safety from COVID and, and social connection. And uh, it, it, it has been, uh, I think many people would call the, the state regulations a sort of a blunt instrument for uh, how uh, to keep people safe. And it has probably had, um, and I think we, we have good evidence uh, that it probably has had a number of negative unintended consequences because of uh, its disconnection of people from their loved ones. There has been a little bit of loosening, as you, as I think uh, uh, you noted, uh, there's now the capability of seeing people maybe once or twice a week in their home, but still that's not the same, especially if you're used to going every single day. And uh, this is something, again, we're working on uh, with our, our state and local uh, agencies to try to think about how to be creative here, how we can do human-centered design that really is focused on the well-being of that person. And we don't have the best answers yet, but it is something that we're quite concerned about. Thank you, Dr. Ritchie. It's helpful to know that it's an active topic for, our, our, for everyone. Now we're gonna move into a few questions about individuals. So how do we get our loved ones to learn a new hobby? Uh, I'll be happy to start, and then I'd love to hear what Dr. Karaki has to say as well. So, uh, you know, all of us tend to be a little bit resistant to change. And uh, so it, it can be, it, it can take some sleuthing, I would say, to find out how to get someone interested in a particular hobby. It's worth thinking about what they pay attention to and how what they pay attention to might then relate to something new that they could do. Um, if they pay attention to cars, is it possible to get them to build model cars? If they pay attention to fabric, is it possible to think about some very, you know, simple but beautiful way to bring that fabric together to do some kind of new kind of quilting? There's many, many, here's the good news. There are many, many different kinds of hobbies. It's just amazing to me how many amazingly creative and different things people do. So learning what might be uh, of interest or at least that they might be willing to try is probably a first step. And then the other thing is if you're able to do it along with, so it's something you all do together, even if it's virtually, that makes it more of a fun endeavor. I'm reading several books right now along with some of my friends who live in other states and it's much more fun to do it along with than to do it alone. And then finally, I would say, you know, uh, gently persevere. Uh, you know, I think if people feel harangued or, you know, uh, nagged, 
then they're, they're not going to be, they'll become increasingly resistant. But if you seem genuinely interested in trying to improve their well-being and you just come alongside, listen hard and think creatively, uh, I'm hopeful that you may find that there's some openness to trying something new. Dr. Akeriki, you probably have some really good sure. ideas. No, I agree with, with all of that. I mean, I, I just, I, I would just add that, um, um, if you have any concern about the barriers to starting a hobby, um, that um, you, you might want to think about, um, for example, um, could there be some depression going on or something that's, that's causing a loss of interest um, that's sort of getting in the way of picking up on a new hobby? Because um, uh, sometimes that can really be the issue. There's sort of, the, it's, it's really about the concern that um, your loved one isn't really doing too much. They're kind of sitting around. They're not really very engaged. And some of that could be just boredom from lack of an activity to be engaged in. But some of that could be related to the mental health aspect that maybe something needs to be tweaked or, or, or bumped up a little bit in terms of depression care or evaluation for that. Um, because that is actually a pretty prominent reason for people to find it difficult to engage in hobbies. Um, but I agree with that, with Christine's advice to, um, participate in the hobby alongside um, someone that's because it's really the social dimension that's actually where the reward is. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of really cool neuroscience behind this, but it, it's, it's really a big part of the payoff for being part of, for doing hobbies for a lot of people is that they're doing it along with other people and they're getting that social reward. Um, so and to that extent, as long as it's something that's interesting enough, <laughs> it's probably just fine. Um, and um, as Christine said, you can kind of take a, take a cue from the kinds of activities that your loved one enjoyed historically. Um, if it's something that they enjoyed for a long time, especially when they were younger, that's probably going to have like a lot of payoff um, as opposed to something that is totally new and you don't really know if it has any particular appeal for them. Great. And I might just add one other thing um, to that really important point, and that is, you know, for some folks, especially if they're dealing with uh, challenges around uh, cognition and cognitive impairment, uh, sometimes people's apathy, their sort of lack of interest, has something to do with a change in their thinking, and that might be a worthwhile uh, reason to have that investigated and to learn more from uh, a healthcare professional. And also, I think it's worth finding out if the person is distressed by their, their lack of activities. Uh, sometimes it distresses us more than it distresses them. And that may be also worth reflecting on um, as you're trying to think about what makes sense. Thank you. And the same um, uh, person asked, and perhaps Dr. Ritchie's uh, uh, um, resources may answer this. How do we meet those young people who feel trapped at home? Oh, that's such a great question. And I wish there was an easy answer, but let me just come up with a few things that, I've, that, that I have thought about and that seem to work for some people. So if you are part of either uh, a, some sort of um, faith community or some other sort of social uh, venue where you gather with other people regularly, it can be a great place to identify folks from other generations and from for young people who frankly need something to do. So that's a useful place to start. Another place is your neighborhood and uh, if there are kids in the neighborhood to reach out to either the parents or to the kids themselves and see if they might enjoy uh, that kind of social connection. This is much harder in the United States than it is in many other countries because we unfortunately do uh, what, what, what uh, sometimes are co it's called generational cohorting or we put people in sort of age uh, silos and that does make it harder. So this is something that I'm eager for us to more consistently find avenues for. The place to start, I would say, is places where you have some social connection, even if it isn't with a, a younger person, but where there might be someone else who knows a younger person who would benefit from that kind of connection. Dr. Carey, key other ideas from you? Oh, I agree. I think especially some of the, the virtual, you know, faith services have been very useful for this. Any type of activity where it's by nature, multi-generational, 
um, where it can bring in uh, younger people along with, um, you know, midlife or older people um, sort of lends itself to this uh, naturally. And fortunately, you know, most organizations, I mean, I think it's about 90% uptake at this point of some kind of uh, virtual um, format available for attending faith services. So um, many places have um, reinstituted some in person, but in terms of maximum safety of the virtual uh, format, this is available. And I, I agree that that might be a really nice way um, to engage folks. And um, there could be other things, maybe virtually um, volunteering to the extent that this is available, um, volunteering to help young people with their schoolwork. Um, young people still have to do high school and college and they still have to do reading and writing and all those kinds of things. And, you know, before COVID, uh, very often older adults are frequently involved with after school tutoring and all these kinds of things. Um, and that's been part of what's been disconnected, right, as well. Um, so I think maybe we need to uh, look for opportunities to, hey, maybe do some virtual homework help um, uh, via Zoom or sort of convert some of those things that used to be happening pretty regularly in person and figure out ways um, to convert that to the virtual format because those are some of the ways that historically have connected older people and younger people. And speaking about those wonderful younger people, here's a question. Um, are there ways to connect with our kids and grandkids? How can we see them safely? And I think that's on a lot of people's minds, especially with Thanksgiving coming up. Both of you, either of you. I'm happy to start. And sure. then Dr. Kierke, I'm sure you have some perspectives as well. This is a very difficult question. And people are answering it based on, frankly, their uh, comfort with risk. So uh, the best way to see folks uh, safely is just like you do in the grocery store, which is you wear a mask and you might even wear a shield, something that's covering your eyes, and you stay a, a, you know, some physical distance apart. And although that feels very strange to do that with our own families, that is probably, and we know that's the safest approach. That's what we do in the hospital is we, we, are, we are instructed and required to wear masks and face shields and or eye uh, coverage at, at all times. So that is by far the safest approach. Then beyond that, it's a matter of thinking about what kind of risk you and your family are comfortable with. There's certainly many families out there who are getting COVID tested before they see each other uh, and sort of quarantining themselves between the time they get COVID tested and, and get their result. And if, and if it's negative, then seeing their loved one. So there are other strategies that are being used and we're learning a lot about that now with colleges opening and how they're actually doing a lot of routine testing. So I think as testing becomes more available, that would be another strategy for being able to see your children um, at least more safely than without that knowledge. Dr. Kierke, other thoughts? Oh, no, I totally agree. I have I've little to add. That sounds perfect. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, it is about um, risk mitigation and risk tolerance. Um, and some people are not comfortable with any kind of a, an approach at in-person meetings. Um, and so it all has to move virtual. But for those people who want to attempt in person, I think as Dr. Ritchie said, um, making sure that there's maximal protection and really keeping a good distance. Like I know a lot of people um, using those eight foot tables, outdoor tables as sort of their benchmark. So they know that they're maintaining the appropriate distance um, rather than trying to eyeball it. Um, you know, those kinds of things are necessary. And it's, it's difficult as we head toward colder weather, unless you're one of the people lucky enough to stock up on those outdoor heaters, um, it's going to be difficult um, to manage that option. So a lot of people will turn to a virtual option um, as a safe way to do it. Um, but no, I agree with, with uh, everything you said. Thank you both. I have, we have time for about two more questions, which I have here. It's what I want to remind our wonderful audience. If you have, if you're sitting there with a comment or a question, now's the time to send it in. So we'll be stopping at around 645. I'd like to read uh, an important question. Uh, they're all important. After I visit my mother, 
who has dementia, I feel very depressed. A little like waking up in the middle of the night, feeling like you don't know what's happening. I'm in therapy and take antidepressants. Do you have any other suggestions for me? Any tips on how to chat with my mother so she isn't just talking about wanting to uh, get out of there? And she's also on antidepressants. An understandable reflection, either of you. Dr. Okereke, you want to? Sure. Well, um, interestingly enough, um, I'll, I'll, I'll make a, a few comments here, but I'd like to hear, actually, Barbara, <laughs> I'd like to hear what you have to say in response to a comment like this, uh, to, to a challenge like this, um, because you um, do so much of this kind of work of, of helping folks cope with exactly this situation. So I'm, first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that that's, um, you know, what you're dealing with. Um, it's, it's, it's incredibly hard. Um, and it's, it's good that there's already some therapy and, and medication treatment that's involved. No question about, um, as I alluded to earlier, um, looking into whether that needs to be tweaked um, in order to, um, to get things tuned up and, and, and dealing with the situation. But in terms of um, helping out mom as well and coping with this feeling, um, I think as we discussed earlier, normalizing that this is a response that's, that's normal um, to this extreme situation. Right? Sometimes we don't acknowledge that we are in an incredibly once in a century extreme situation. Um, and uh, just recognizing that um, that context um, is part of what might be driving um, feeling so awful sometimes we have that middle of the night feeling. Um, and um, and, you know, and, and certainly, you know, either Barbara or Christine can weigh in on accessing resources in terms of um, connecting with other people who are going through similar situations um, and feeling that um, sense of community around that. I think that's a lot of what happens for the collaborative, but um, I think that's going to be also an important part of coping with some of this. Now, we have this expression in psychiatry, we always say, don't worry alone. Whatever it is that's happening, that's your worry. Um, you, you can't be alone in it. And, and chances are you're not. There's a whole lot of other people who, are share, who, who could share that worry with you. So I'll just, uh, I'll leave it at that. And I'll just say, and then turn to Dr. Ritchie, I'd like to say that, in fact, I'm very grateful that I facilitate two support groups here on Zoom through the Dementia Caregiver Support Program. Um, and what people report is even when they don't necessarily have an answer to a burning question, there's a very special magic when you know you're speaking to someone else and other people who share much of your uh, same emotion. So if you have my name and number, feel free to contact me and I can easily tell you about um, our support groups and also the Alzheimer's Association uh, offers a tremendous number of Zoom support groups. But I think the answer is, which Dr. O'Kerrickey alluded to, and everything Dr. Ritchie alluded to, both of you, is connection with other people. And in this case, people who share the similar dilemma and feelings of helplessness about um, how to help me and how to help my parent with dementia. Dr. Ritchie, any comment? I so appreciate what you both said. I think, you know, the, the whole idea that this is a once in a century experience that people are going through, this is not normal. And uh, to validate that this is not normal is such an important thing to think about for ourselves and, and for those around us. And to sometimes just be with them and bear witness to the difficulty that they're experiencing um, a, a, as, a, as a, a, someone coming alongside just to bear witness to, to the difficulty uh, because we don't have, we really don't have sometimes easy answers. Thank you. Um, on that profound and important empathic note, uh, I wanna thank both Dr. O'Kerrake and Richie for what was for me, um, and I've heard you speak a number of times, but a very moving and important night. Uh, the comments and questions from our attendees 
uh, make clear that you you hit us all where we're living right now and I am very grateful and I thank all of you who joined us um, Nori, Judy, Chris, uh, Susan and I our hope is to help you connect with each other and we're here to uh, connect with you and 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 we're supported by Drs. Richie and O'Karaki and so together we really are trying to build community for you. Uh, so thank you. And I just want to let you all know um, that uh, our next program, and you'll be receiving an invitation from Nori, is on November 17th. And to augment what we heard Dr. Christine Ritchie say about good food, and I love that picture of those vegetables. And they're not that colorful in, in, in my grocery, but that was gorgeous. We have a wonderful speaker, Nancy Emerson Lombardo, Dr. Nancy Emerson Lombardo, whose topic will be, what does science tell us about, about which foods will help protect our brains? So you'll hear more about that, as well as upcoming uh, programs and seminars. And be well, be safe, everyone. And again, thank you so much to our magnificent speakers tonight. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone, good night.